Microbial Ecology, Chapter 30. So this is basically a review of biology when you learned about ecology and all the different levels and the relationships and like symbiotic relationships and the trophic levels and food chains and food webs, but we're just going to be applying it to microbes now. So if you remember, ecology is the study of relationships of organisms to each other and to their environment. So one individual is our lowest level of ecological organization. A group of that same individuals, so a group of elk, make up a population. Then you have a group of elk plus a group of mountain lions plus a group of uh, rabbits plus a population of trees and bushes. And so all of these different living populations make up a community. And then once you add in all of your abiotic factors into the next level, like the atmosphere and the water and the temperature um, with your living things, that's now your ecosystem. And then all the different ecosystems in the world, they can combine and make biomes. And then all the biomes of the world make up the biosphere. Ecosystems vary within the biosphere in biodiversity and biomass. Biodiversity is the number of species present and their evenness of distribution. So how are they distributed in the ecosystem? Are they clumped? Are they scattered? Are they randomly distributed? The biomass is going to be the weight of all the organisms present in the ecosystem. Microorganisms play a major role in most ecosystems, if not all. The role of an organism plays in, in an ecosystem is called its ecological niche. And you can pronounce that however you like. Niche, niche, I don't care. The environment immediately surrounding the microorganism is called the microenvironment. The macroenvironment may be more easily measured and is very different from the microenvironment. Organisms are categorized according to their trophic level. So trophic just means food. There's three general trophic levels, primary producers, consumers, and decomposers and we'll quickly remind you of what those are. Primary producers are autotrophs that convert carbon dioxide to organic materials, and they include two types, photoautotrophs, photo means light, so these are getting their energy from the sunlight. Organisms that are photoautotrophs are plants, algae, cyanobacteria, and anoxygenic phototrophs. Chemoautotrophs, on the other hand, are not using light to make their own food. They're using chemicals in their environment. So they oxidize inorganic compounds to make their own energy, and they still are serving as a primary producer in their food chain. Examples of these guys are going to be like the bacteria that live in the deep, deep ocean where no light penetrates. Then we have our consumers. Consumers are heterotrophs that rely on the primary producers, you have herbivores that eat primary producers, and so they don't eat meat. These guys are called primary consumers. Secondary consumers are going to be carnivores that eat those herbivores. Carnivores that eat other carnivores are called tertiary consumers, and the chain of consumption is called the food chain. An interaction between food chains in an ecosystem, so the overlapping of different food chains, is called a food web. Then we have decomposers. Decomposers are heterotrophs that digest the remains of primary producers and consumers. The complete breakdown of organic molecules to inorganic molecules is called mineralization. Decomposers are typically going to be fungus and bacterial species. Microbes often grow in communities attached to some type of solid surface or at an air-water interface. They usually grow in biofilms, or what we call microbial mats. A microbial mat is a thick, dense, organized structure composed of very distinctive layers. Frequently, you have green, pink, and black. The green layer is typically composed of various species of cyanobacteria, and they're green because they have chloroplast because they're producers. They're creating their own food using the energy from the sunlight. The pink layer consists of purple sulfur bacteria, which are heterotrophs. The black layer is formed by iron molecules reacting with hydrogen sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide produced by bacteria are called sulfate reducers. 
when bacteria grow in groups and build up on like your teeth, for example, that would be an example of a biofilm. This is an example of a food chain in an ocean made up of microorganisms. So you have the phytoplankton, which are your producers that are creating the energy for the rest of the chain. And then you have your heterotrophs, like your bacterioplankton, your flagellated microplankton, your ciliate protozoans, and your zooplankton. Deep lakes and oceans have characteristic zones. Each zone is going to have different amounts of sunlight, so it's going to have different organisms that can live there. The zones are influenced um, by microbial populations as well. The upper zone has sufficient light penetration to support your photosynthetic organisms. The organic material produced by these organisms descends and is metabolized by the heterotrophs. Marine environments range from deep seas to shallow coastal regions. Nutrients are scarce in the deep sea regions because there's not much light penetration, so the only producers you have down there are your chemoautotrophs. The nutrients are very abundant, though, in shallow coastal regions, where sunlight does penetrate easily. Seawater contains high salt concentrations, which supports halophilic microorganisms. Ocean waters are usually oligotrophic, which means they're nutrient poor. This limits the growth of microorganisms. The ecology of inshore areas are not as stable as the deep sea. They can be dramatically affected by nutrient-rich runoff. So the consequence is going to be populations of algae and cyanobacteria are going to be huge, which reduces the amount of oxygen in the water for the other organisms, and that's creating hypoxic regions, which are also called dead zones. In lakes and streams, the types and numbers of organisms living there depends on multiple factors, like light, concentration of dissolved oxygen, nutrients, and the temperature of the water. Some unique aquatic environments include, like the Great Salt Lakes, water in these lakes evaporate, leaving very high concentrations of salt, much higher than seawater. So extreme halophiles live in the Great Salt Lakes. Iron springs contain large quantities of ferrous ions. These are habitats for Gallinella species. And sulfur springs support the growth of both photosynthetic and non-photosynthetic sulfur bacteria. Microbes are also found in terrestrial habitats. Human interest in microbiology of the soil stems from the ability of microbes to synthesize a variety of useful chemicals. 500 different antibiotic substances are produced by the Streptomyces species. 50 have a useful application in medicine, agriculture, and industry. Soil microbes are being tested for their ability to be able to degrade toxic chemicals as well. So soil is composed of pulverized rock, decaying organic material, air, and water. It teems with microbial life including bacteria, fungi, algae, and protozoa. Other life includes insects, worms, and plant roots. The soil environment can fluctuate abruptly and dramatically depending on the location. Soil has multiple layers, called horizons. Each horizon has distinctive characteristics. The topsoil is known as the A-horizon. It's dark, nutrient-rich, it supports plant growth, and the depth can vary from location to location. So it may be a couple inches thick, or it may even be a foot thick. The subsoil is known as the B-horizon. This is where you have the accumulation of clay, salts, and nutrients that are leached from the topsoil, which means they flow down. The sea horizon is partially weathered bedrock, and the bedrock, hard, solid bedrock, is the R horizon. It's the lowest layer, and it's not weathered. Microorganisms of the soil. Density and composition of microbial flora of soil is affected by environmental conditions. Wet soils are unfavorable for growth due to lack of air. During drought, water availability drops and many organisms decrease. Many organisms produce survival forms, such as endospores and cysts, to survive for long periods of time in the soil until the environmental conditions improve. Other environmental influences include acidity, temperature, and nutrient supply. Prokaryotes are the most numerous soil inhabitants. 
Their physiological diversity allows for the colonization of all types of soil. Of soil microbes, gram-positive are more abundant than gram-negative. The most common gram-positive in the soil are bacillus species. They produce endospores that allow for survival for long periods of time. Fungi are usually found in the top portions of soil due to their aerobic nature, meaning they have to have oxygen. Fungi are crucial in decomposing plant matter. Some fungi are free living in the soil. Others develop symbiotic relationships with certain plant roots. So mycorrhizae is an example of a symbiotic relationship between a fungus and a plant. It enhances the competitiveness of plants by being able to uptake certain nutrients that the fungus is providing the plant. There's two common mycorrhizal relationships. Endomycorrhizae, the fungus penetrates the root cells, they grow within the cell, and it's the most common relationship in plants. And ectomycorrhizae, so ecto meaning outside, the fungus grows outside the plant cells, forming a sheath around the root. They are mainly associated with certain types of trees. Symbiotic nitrogen fixers are really important in the world. Being able to fix that locked up nitrogen in the soil and making it usable for plants, which then makes it usable for us and other animals, is really important. Organisms collectively are called rhizobia the most agriculturally important nitrogen fixers. They tend to be associated with leguminous plants like beans and peas. The association between plants and rhizobia involves chemical communication between the partners. So in this chart here, you can see the crop and then the microbial species that is in association with it. Microorganisms also have important relationships with herbivores. So herbivores rely on plants in order to eat. Well, plants aren't necessarily easy to digest in your stomach. So in ruminants such as cows and sheep, the compartment is called the rumen. The rumen is located in front of the true stomach. In non-ruminants, like horses, it's called the cecum. The cecum lies between the small and the large intestine. Microbes that inhabit these compartments digest the cellulose and the hemicellulose to compounds that can be used as nutrients for the animal. Cellulose and hemicellulose are major components of plants that otherwise, without the microbes, couldn't easily be broken down. So in the cow and, and in other ruminants, like sheep, the rumen is found right here, and that's where the microbes are doing their magic. And then in your non-ruminants, like horses, the cecum is right here in between the small intestine and the colon, which is the large intestine. 